Any preliminary matters that we have not already discussed that we need to discuss before the jury comes up? Your Honor, I would just let the court know that I was contacted by the, um, I'm just going to call her an interpreter coordinator, Jamie Hernandez, to provide a copy of any transcript of any video or audio that would have speaking. Uh, so I let defense counsel know, and I've given uh, the interpreter the transcript. I said we can also give them a copy of that recording. It will not be used today. So they'll have time to review that. All right. Thank you. That will be helpful. Anything from the defendant before we bring the jury up? Uh, Your Honor, just a small request. Ms. Avila does have a chronic back uh, pain, and that was why we were coming in a little late earlier. Just want to ask the court's indulgence. If that becomes an issue, if we can ask for a quick request. I'll allow, I'll allow her to stand up if necessary. Um, and if a recess is required, we'll do that. Okay, we'll just uh, go off record and tell, the, tell me the jury is ready to come, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, I'm advised they're just getting the interpretation equipment uh, on the jurors that need it. Let's go ahead and go back on record, State of New Mexico versus Alexis Nicole Avila. CR 2022-13, please stand for the jury. You may be seated. Your Honor, I just, the interpreter wanted to bring the court's attention. There was another gentleman that asked for the services, Your Honor, uh, just right now. So, um, I'll, maybe interpret asked the court to ask the gentleman whether he understood everything that was said uh, in the, uh, in or the selection. It? Yes, Your Honor, because he just came up to me just right now. All right. Uh, what's your juror number? It's 14. My member is Jose Gaitan. Number 14? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm going to go through the interpreter. Yes, yes, yes. We 
have spent the morning uh, asking questions of jurors. You speak limited English? Limited. Do you feel like you were able to understand what was going on? You've asked for the services of an interpreter. Why? Para more extend the English. A little more extend So that I can understand the English a little bit more. Council want to approach. Council. Okay, uh, juror number 14. The court's going to excuse you at this time. Uh, it's very important that you understood all the questions. And if there was any question about whether you did understand everything that was said and everything that was asked, uh, we're going to go ahead and excuse you at this time. Thank you for your jury service. Please stand for the jury. Thank you. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Judge Schubert. My bailiff today that has been escorting you and assisting with communicating to the court is Francis Colvin. My administrative assistant sits back here behind me. Uh, she is Candy Rodriguez. If you need anything during the course of the trial, please let one of the ladies know and we'll do our best to try to accommodate you. Sitting to my right, is Alexis uh, Gutierrez. She's the court monitor. She's the person that makes a record of everything that's said here in court. This is a criminal case commenced by the state against the defendant Alexis Avila. The defendant has been charged in count one with attempt to commit a felony to wit first degree murder or alternatively abuse of a child resulting in great bodily harm. Each uh, charge is to be considered separately. The defendant is presumed to be innocent. The burden is on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. I will be giving you these preliminary instructions. These instructions, along with those previously given, are preliminary only and may be changed during or at the end of the trial. All of you must pay close attention to the evidence. After you've heard all the evidence, I will read the final instructions of law to you. You will also receive a written copy of the final instructions. You must follow the final instructions in deciding the case. This case is expected to last four days. We'll do our best to move the case along, but delays in presentation of evidence can occur. We'll do our best to make good use of your time. The usual hours of trial will be from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. with lunch and occasional rest breaks. Unless a different starting time is announced, please report to the jury room by 8.15 in the morning. Please do not come back into the courtroom until you are called by the bailiff. You are allowed, but not required, to take notes during the trial. Note paper has been provided for that purpose. Notes should not take the place of your independent memory of the evidence. 
When taking notes, please remember the importance of paying close attention to the trial. Listening and watching witnesses during their testimony will help you assess their appearance, behavior, memory, and whatever else bears on their credibility. At each recess, you must either leave your notes on your chair or take them with you to the jury room. At the end of the day, the bailiff will store your notes and return them to you when the trial resumes. When deliberations commence, you will take your notes with you to the jury room. Ordinarily, at the end of the case, the notes will be collected and destroyed. A criminal trial generally begins with the lawyers telling you what they expect the evidence to show. These statements and other statements made by the lawyers during the course of the trial can be of considerable assistance to you in understanding the evidence as it is presented at trial. Statements of the lawyers, however, are not themselves evidence. The evidence will be the testimony of witnesses, exhibits, and any facts agreed to by the lawyers. After you've heard all the evidence, I will instruct you on the law. The lawyers will argue the case and you will then retire to the jury room to arrive at a verdict. It is my duty to decide what evidence you may consider. Your job is to find and determine the facts in this case, which you must do solely upon the evidence received in court. It is the duty of a lawyer to object to questions, testimony, or exhibits the lawyer believes may not be proper, and you must not hold such objection against the state or the defendant. I will sustain objections if it's improper for you to consider such evidence. If I sustain an objection to evidence, you must not consider such evidence, nor may you consider any evidence which I have told you to disregard. By itself, a question is not evidence. You must not speculate about what would be the answer to a question which I rule cannot be answered. It is for you to decide whether the witnesses know what they are talking about and whether or not they're being truthful. You may give the testimony of any witness, whatever weight you believe it merits. You may take into account, among other things, the witness's ability and opportunity to observe, memory, manner, or any bias or prejudice that the witness may have and the reasonableness of the testimony considered in the light of all the evidence in the case. No ruling, gesture, or comment I make during the course of the trial should influence your decision in this case. At times I may ask questions of witnesses. If I do, such questions do not in any way indicate my opinion about the facts or indicate the weight I feel you should give to the testimony of the witness. Ordinarily, the attorneys will develop all pertinent evidence. It is the exception rather than the rule that an individual juror will have an unanswered question after all the evidence is presented. However, if you feel that an important question has not been asked or answered, write it down on a piece of note paper and give it to the bailiff before the witness leaves the witness stand. I will decide whether or when your question will be asked. Rules of evidence or other considerations apply to questions you submit and may prevent the question from being asked. If the question is not asked, please do not give it any further consideration do not discuss it with your fellow jurors, and do not hold it against either side that you did not get an answer. There are a number of important rules governing your conduct as jurors during the trial. You must decide the case solely upon the evidence received in court. You must not consider anything you may have read or heard about the case outside the courtroom. During the trial, and your deliberations, you must avoid news accounts of the trial, 
whether they be on radio, television, the internet, or in a newspaper or other written publication. You must not visit the scene of the incident on your own. You cannot make experiments with reference to the case. You, as jurors, must decide the case based solely on the evidence presented here within the four walls of this courtroom. This means that during the trial, you must not conduct any independent research about the case, the matters in this case, the individuals or corporations involved in the case. In other words, you should not consult dictionaries or reference materials, search the internet, websites, blogs, or use any other electronic tools to obtain information about this case or to help you decide the case. Do not try to find out information from any source outside the confines of this courtroom. After the parties have made their closing statements, you will retire to deliberate. Until you retire to deliberate, you may not discuss this case with anyone, even with your fellow jurors. After you retire to deliberate, you may begin discussing the case with your fellow jurors, but you cannot discuss, discuss the case with anyone else, including your family and friends, until you have returned a verdict and the case is at an end. I know that many of you use cell phones, the internet, and other tools of technology. You are not to discuss or provide any information to anyone about this case through telephone calls or text messages. You are also not to engage in any social media interaction communication or exchange of information about this case until I have accepted your verdict and this case is at a close. This rule applies to all chats, comments, direct messages, instant messages, posts, tweets, blogs, vlogs, or any other means of communicating, sharing, or exchanging information through social media. It is important that you keep an open mind and not decide any part of the case until the entire case has been completed and submitted to you. Your special responsibility as jurors demands that throughout this trial you exercise your judgment impartially and without regard to sympathy, bias, or prejudice. Therefore, until you retire to deliberate the case, you must not discuss this case or the evidence with anyone, even with each other, because you have not heard all the evidence, you have not been instructed on the law, and you have not heard the final arguments of the lawyers. If an exhibit in, is admitted in evidence, you should examine it yourself and not talk about it with other jurors until you retire to deliberate. To minimize the risk of accidentally overhearing something that is not evidence in this case, please continue to wear the jurors' badges while in and around the courthouse. If someone happens to discuss the case in your presence, discuss that fact uh, as quickly as you can to a member of the staff. Although it is natural to visit with people you meet, please do not talk with any of the attorneys, parties, witnesses or spectators, either in or outside the courtroom. If you meet in the elevator or in the hallways, there's nothing wrong with saying good morning or good afternoon, but your conversation should end there. If the attorneys, parties, and witnesses do not greet you outside of court or avoid riding the elevator with you, they are not being rude, they are simply following this rule. The uh, rule of exclusion of witnesses, I assume, is requested? Yes, sir. This means that witnesses other than the parties, representatives of the state, and expert witnesses will wait outside the courtroom until they're called to testify. Witnesses may not talk to other witnesses while they're waiting to testify. The lawyers are responsible for monitoring their own witnesses 
to assure that they do not enter the courtroom. The prosecuting attorney now will now make an opening statement if she desires. The defendant's attorney may make an opening statement if she desires or may wait until later in the trial to do so. What is said in opening statements is not evidence. The opening statement is simply the lawyer's opportunity to tell you what she expects the evidence to show. Ms. Luce? Uh, Your Honor, I, I will be presenting the evidence. All right, Mr. Provosco. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard the charges announced for you that will be for your consideration. This is a case of an attempted killing of a newborn baby boy on about January 7th of 2022. What you're going to hear through the course of this trial is the significance of the phrase that a picture is worth a thousand words. And the reason why I say that is because you will not just be presented with testimonial evidence through the course of this trial, but you will actually be able to view for yourself the defendant, Ms. Alexis Avila, committing this crime. The defendant, Alexis Avila, driving in her white Jetta, picking the dumpster that she will throw her newborn baby boy into. The black bag that the defendant, Alexis Avila, has put uh, the baby inside of. Uh, the hair tie, eventually that you will be able to see through the course of testimony that she used to affix to the end of this plastic bag, essentially rendering it as a coffin, plastic coffin. And you will see with your own eyes the defendant take this bag with the newborn baby child inside of it and chuck it into the dumpster. And you will be able to see with your own eyes that even before baby Avila makes contact with the garbage and refuse of this dumpster, the defendant, Alexis Avila, is already making her getaway. She's already turning to re-enter her vehicle and to drive away on this cold January day while her newborn baby is left in a dumpster. Now, I use the term attempted killing. And the reason why I say that is because you're going to hear from some witnesses who about five to six hours later, thankfully, by providence, hear what they think is a cat wailing from the dumpster. And you will hear from their testimony about the heroic efforts that they took to find this baby, notwithstanding the defendant's efforts to kill this child. And you will hear from them about their call to 911, about the rendering of emergency services, and about the treatment that baby Avila received. And that despite her best efforts, this child survived. And so when I say a picture is worth a thousand words, I say it because you will be able to see uh, the acts that the defendant did in throwing her child away into this dumpster. You will be able to see the initial acts of those who attempted to save the child. And critically, the third part of this case that just shows the importance of the video we'll be playing for you will actually be the defendant, Alexis Avila, admitting to what she had done, and filling in the pieces and the circumstances of what was happening on January 7th. Because what the evidence is going to show you is that this case is not just about the choices that Alexis Avila took to kill her own child. This case is also about the consequences of those choices. Now, when I'm talking about choices, what the evidence is going to show in terms of what the defendant, Alexis Avila, did to kill her own newborn boy. You will hear testimony about how she, was, she knew that she was pregnant prior to the day that she gave birth. You're going to hear about the circumstances of that birth at the house that she shared with her parents. You're going to hear about the efforts that the defendant took to put that newborn baby inside a garbage bag. You're going to hear about her cutting the baby's umbilical cord and leaving it exposed to the elements. You're going to be hearing about her efforts 
uh, and you'll be hearing this from law enforcement seeing pictures of the cleanup inside of the bathroom from this birth that she gave. You're going to be able to see in the video that we've described earlier uh, the choice. It's about a mile that she drives in order to go out to uh, behind the rig outfitters in Hobbs, New Mexico. Approximately a mile that she drives in her vehicle after making the choice of putting her baby inside this plastic bag with a loosely fitting hair tie inside of her vehicle and driving that vehicle for the purpose of disposing and killing her own child. And you're going to be able to see her choice pri just prior to, just prior to the throwing of this child, of her selecting the dumpster that she's going to do it in, her choice of throwing the child into the dumpster, her choice of turning her back on her child in order to drive away from the dumpster. And you will be able to see her choice of continuing to drive away. And what you're going to hear through the course of the testimony is the time period then, involving the choice of her not alerting anyone, not calling any authorities, not seeking any help. And during that period of time, it'll be terminated by you hearing the testimony of the choices that other people made that day. Not the choices made by the defendant, but the choices made by those that saved this child's life. You're going to hear from this group of witnesses from Hector Jasso, Michael Green, and April Noah, dumpster divers. You're going to hear about what they were doing that day. They were dumpster diving. And very fortunately, hearing the cries of this wailing child and saving that child, you're going to hear about their choice of what they did next, about their choice to contact 911 to help save this child's life. You're going to hear about the choices of the medical personnel and law enforcement officers that were involved in saving this child's life. And what will be important about this last group of witnesses, the medical professionals uh, in particular, is you're going to hear about just how deadly and dangerous chucking a newborn child in the frigid cold of a January day into a dumpster is towards life. You're going to be hearing testimony about the probability of death whenever a newborn is exposed to the elements. You're going to be hearing testimony with regards to the baby's hypothermia, kidney function, and blood loss, all as a result of what the defendant, Alexis Avila, did to her own child that day, to baby Avila. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when you've seen the videos and you've heard the testimony, uh, what you will hear from us at the close of that evidence is just to believe your eyes to believe your eyes and to believe your ears. Because at the close of our presentation of evidence where you're able to see the defendant's choices in contrast to the choices of those that cared about this child's life, we will be asking you to return guilty verdict for the child abuse resulting in great bodily harm and for the attempted murder charge as well. Thank you for your time and careful attention through the course of this trial. Ms. Adepoju, do you wish to open at this time? Or, okay. Mr. Connolly. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, uh, again, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, I'm Raymond Connolly uh, with uh, Ibukun Adepoju and Tashika Curley. We represent uh, Ms. Avila, Alexis Avila. And so, you know, the, the, the government gets up, and, and again, I want to remind you that when you do, when we do opening statements, that's what the parties expect the evidence to show, okay? So it's not evidence, it's just what the parties expect to show. And I, I, I submit to you folks that defense, our position isn't that much, we expect the evidence to show much of what the government just elicited. You will see... Um, a video of what they described. What I would say the difference would be is the take we have on that evidence. Because as the prosecutor just mentioned, um, at the end there's going to be uh, arguments that they're going to make. And of course they're going to ask you to, of course they're going to ask you to find her guilty of child abuse resulting in great bodily harm and uh, attempted first degree murder. And so we're we're not in a whole lot of disagreement about what a lot of the evidence will show. It's the take on that evidence. That's, that's the difference. And that's going to be the issue in the case. So, as you just heard, and you, you didn't hear much of it at the outset, I think the focus of the opening statement of the prosecution was attempted first-degree murder and, and 
maybe there's a reason or a strategy in emphasizing that because it, it sounds it sounds awful. Um, and at the end, they, they mentioned the fact that he's, she's also charged with child abuse resulting in great bodily harm. So I want you to pay, pay close attention during the trial to the evidence. I want you to do that. Um, I submit to you that, that at the end of this, defense isn't going to be asking you to find her absolutely not guilty. We're going to be asking you to hold her accountable for something, for her actions, but not for what they've charged her with. And so um, I'm going to leave that for argument, because if I go, if I go any further, that's what it will become. It will become argument, and that's objectionable during an opening statement. So I want you to pay close attention to a lot of the evidence. They mentioned a lot of things about um, Met, you're going to hear from experts, you're going to hear about certain things that they did to take care of this child after they recovered it. Um, but I don't believe what you're going to hear is evidence of great bodily harm or great bodily injury. I think, I think you'll, hear, you'll, you'll be asked to find that beyond a reasonable doubt at some point. But that's going to become the issue. The issue is whether or not they can show that, that as a result of the actions of our client, that it resulted in great bodily injury. That's that's the real issue here. So we're not gonna, you know, I mean, it is what it is. You're gonna see, like they said, you're gonna see a video evidence. You're gonna hear from experts. It's, it's. I think what we're gonna ask you to do is pay close attention to the evidence, and you'll get instructions about not having sympathy nor prejudice. You'll get instructed on that. You haven't heard the instructions yet, and like I said. Um, if we ask you to hold a group accountable of something, that, that'll be for the end, because that's when the judge will instruct you on, on your options as to what, what the, what, well, there's two charges that the government has brought, but the options of what it is you have to decide in terms of the facts of this case. So please pay close attention to the evidence. And a lot of it is going to be emotionally challenging. And so what, what, what I think attorneys should be looking for is a jury who is going to analyze the evidence and set emotions aside, set aside prejudice or, or sympathy. Because that slices both ways. We don't want you to have sympathy for our client, but we also don't want you to be over prejudiced based on your emotions, based on what you see. We want you to assess the evidence and then make a decision based on that evidence that's legal in nature. And you're going to hear an instruction where that's all, that's your all, that's your all's job. If that's the proper way to say it. Your all's job. Y'all's job. How about that? So you're going to be judges and you get to determine this case. You get to determine the facts of the case and then how those facts apply to the jury instructions on the crimes charge. So again, um, I don't necessarily disagree with what the evidence is going to show. It's, it's, the, it's the interpretation thereof that, I, that is that issue in this case. So pay attention to that. Um, and uh, that, that's, all, that's, all we have to, that's all I have to say at this point, and I appreciate your attention. The state will now present its evidence. After the state has presented its evidence, the defendant may present evidence, but is not required to do so because the burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Ms. Luce, are you calling the first witness? Yes, Your Honor. The state will call uh, Joseph and Rudolph.
please state your name for the jury. Joseph Embriali. And uh, what city and state do you reside in? Hobbs, New Mexico. And uh, do you have a business in Hobbs? Yes, I do. What is your business? Rig Outfitters. And what is uh, Rig Outfitters? What do you do at your uh, business? Rig, it's, I cater to the oil field um, worker, plus we carry furniture, appliances, electronics, basically everything. <laughs> What's the address of your store? 1401 North Turner, suite number six. And is that in Hobbs, Lee County, New Mexico? Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, is this location associated with a larger building or structure? Yes, I anchor them all. Uh, and tell us a little bit about um, uh, your business. Uh, what are its like normal hours? Um, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday and 10 to 5 on Sunday. Now, do you have uh, more than one public entrance into the store where customers come in? Yeah, two entrances, yes. Uh, and is there uh, any entrance that's, uh, or exit maybe, uh, that's like employees only? Uh, the receiving door. Now, uh, as part of operating your business, uh, have you ever set up any uh, cameras of any type? Quite a few. Tell us about the locations of where the cameras uh, that you have would have been back uh, January 7th of 2022. Um, I have about 20 cameras total, two in the back of the store and on the, uh, the outside, and I have about five on the front of the store on the outside and the rest are on the inside of the store. And how do those cameras uh, function? Are they continuous feed? Continuous feed, yeah. Um, log in to get a live feed, and plus they're always recording. Always recording. Always. Now, uh, do you have um, any reason from time to time to check them, or is it just when like maybe something occurs, then you check them? Usually when something occurs, if I get a phone call or one of my employees call me and say, hey, look, take a look at the cameras, um, normally that's what happens. Every once in a while, I'll just to check up on things. I'll, I'll log in and look at them. And are, are you the one that, if you do need something off of your camera, are you the one that logs in and yes. looks at that? Yes. Um, and even if you're not inside your business, are you able to access or do you have to go down to the store to do it? I'm able to access it off my phone. Uh, now, um, did you um, become aware that uh, there was something of interest, perhaps, on your videos uh, from January 7th of 2022? Yes, I received a phone call from the Ops Police Department. And did you check uh, these multiple cameras that you had to see if anything of interest was on there? Not at the time, because I got the phone call. They just asked if there were real cameras and if they were, they were recording. I said yes. And they asked that they wanted to see the recording, so um, I went down there as quick as I could because it sounded like it was pretty important. So I went down there and you know and showed them that you know we both were looking at the same time and just went through the video at that time. You know, went back to that day and looked through all the video. Now, did you find any video uh, that related to uh, the the front of the store, the front area? I didn't, we didn't look at the front camera, just, we just looked at the back cameras. And did you find a video uh, at the back that uh, became of interest? Yes. And did you then give that video to the Hobbs Police Department? We put it on the thumb, I put it on the thumb drive and gave it to the detective. Now, describe a little bit the back of the store. What is in the back of the store? What's the area? Um, it's just a receiving area for the mall. You have some dumpsters back there, along with three dumpsters, and there's some more dumpsters down where Burks is. Um, but it's basically almost like an alleyway, big alleyway, but it's for receiving product for all the mall. That's where all the receiving comes in, for the whole entire mall. Now, did your uh, cameras for the back of the store, uh, did they angle towards any uh, any dumpsters? Yes. And were those dumpsters associated with like your your store use? Yes, they're my, they're my dumpsters. They're your dumpsters. 
Uh, and is that the video that was that you gave to the Hollis Police Department? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Your Honor, I have um, I have a first a, a USB with uh, two videos on it. States Exhibit two and three. Um, I'll see. If, I don't know if there's an objection. Any ob objection to States Exhibits two and three? No objection. Thanks. States exhibits two and three are received into evidence and may be published to the jury. Uh, these exhibits and any exhibits uh, you'll be watching on the uh, video. With regard to the exhibit, uh, just as with oral testimony, you may give any exhibit such weight and value as you think it deserves in helping you decide what happened in this case. You may proceed. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I believe I have correctly selected video on the screen. I'm sorry, my computer functions differently. We have to drag and drop it to the screen. Okay, I now have uh, the first one up there. Let's hope it'll be full screen. I apologize for making sure. Okay. All right. We now have the full screen. Uh, Mr. Umbrelli, um, do you recognize the view that we have in the beginning of this video? Yes. How do you recognize it? Okay. And where are we facing uh, from this angle? What are we looking towards? Uh, well, actually, looking west towards the back of the store. Um, it's right out my receiving door is right underneath it. And we see uh, three dumpsters uh, in this view. Uh, are those the dumpsters you were telling the jury that are the dumpsters for your store? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, Your Honor, for the record, uh, this video is 40 seconds, and there's no sound, and I'm going to let it play for the jury. All right.
I've paused it. Um, it's one second to go. Uh, Mr. Morelli, we can see on this screen um, a date and a time. Uh, and was the date and time for your camera system accurate at that time? Yes, it was. And so the date that we see of January 7th, 2022 at 2.01 and 5 seconds p.m., that it was accurate at that, that day and time? Can the jury hear the answers? Mr. Morelli, we now have uh, State's Exhibit 3 up on the view on the screen. Um, are you able to see that on your your uh, uh, monitor at the witness stand? Yes, ma'am. Um, and uh, this is a, a different angle. Yes. Uh, tell us uh, what direction or is this camera uh, angle from your store facing? It's uh, directing south towards the end of the mall. And so... Um, is this kind of like a, I don't know, do you call this an alley behind the store? It's an alleyway to where all the receiving truckers come through to deliver. And uh, once again, we see on uh, the bottom, towards the middle of this view of the video, a date and time of uh, January 7, 2022 at 2.01.01 p.m. Yes. Uh, and that is on there from your camera system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and was that date and time accurate at that time? Yes, it was. Um, Your Honor, for the record, this video is uh, a minute and 16 seconds. There's not sound, and I'm going to uh, play it. <coughs> Now, um, had you, um, prior to the, the January 7th, 2022, when you were asked to look for videos, um, were you aware that individuals would, would come to your dumpsters and look for things, take things out, you know, kind of hunt for, for maybe something was thrown away that was still of some kind of value to them? Yeah, it happens um, all the time. And so, um, did you become aware that there was uh, any kind of recording of individuals also looking through, kind of rummaging through uh, the dumpsters? Yeah. Well, when we were watching this video, we watched the whole uh, the whole feed and, and noticed that we did have dumpster divers at night. And was that video as collected and provided? It was all part of that same video given to the hospital. Yes, it was. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the state has uh, state's exhibit four. That's fine. No objection? No, sir. Exhibit four is received and may be published.
Okay. Uh, Mr. Embrioli, uh, we now have State's Exhibit 4 up on the screen. Um, do you recognize uh, what we are uh, now have up? Yes. Uh, and what are, are we seeing now? The similar location, just a different time of day? Yeah, same camera. Uh, it shows your three dumpsters? Yes. Uh, and then it has the, the date of January 7, 2022. It now has a time of 7.36 and 05 uh, p.m. in the evening. Yes. And um, you, uh, uh, your cameras, you said, run all the time? Yes. Uh, your Honor, this uh, video uh, is 15 minutes and 16 seconds. It does not have sound, and with the court's permission, I will play it for the jury. We may publish it in evidence.
Mr. Grioli, I've stopped it with just two seconds to go and ask you a, a question. We saw an, an officer walk towards and shine the poker flashlight up. Is that where your cameras are located? Yes, it is. Uh, and did you go down to the store that same night on the 7th? Yes, I did. Um, we noticed that the from the video, it appears that the individuals that were going through the dumpsters were wearing like uh, jackets. 
Uh, do you recall uh, what the weather or temperature was like that it night? It was in the 20s all day. It was very cold that day. Was your store open business? Was that a business day you were open that day? We closed at 7. Closed at 7? Yes. So um, at the, the time earlier that we saw the 2 p.m. range <clears throat> time, that we saw the, the first two videos, your store was open during that time? Yes. And do your employees have a certain time of day that like the trash or boxes or things are taken out to the dumpster? Just periodically, whenever we need to dump trash, we dump trash. So it's not like they, they do it first thing in the morning or at the end of the day, it can be throughout the hours? Yes. I'll go ahead and let it finish the end. And um, when your employees go and put um, boxes or bags of trash or whatever they put in the dumpsters, then how is the trash collected from your dumpsters? Uh, I think every Mondays and Thursdays they come and pick up the trash. And so is it a, a truck that comes yeah, by? Yeah, it's a waste management. So uh, Mondays and Thursdays? I believe so, yes. But it's only two times a week? Yes. Your Honor, I will pass the witness. Cross exam, Mr. Collins? Yes, you can. <coughs> State your name for me again. Joseph Embriali. Embriali. Did I say it right? Embriali? Embriali, yes. Yeah. I don't think I have a whole lot of questions for you, sir. I'm just going to clarify some things. So, um, you talked about it, it, it being on continuous feed, it's always recording, and, and this, these are cameras that are located on the back of your business, is that right? Correct. And, and I'm assuming you have those for security purposes. Yes. Um, now, you, you said something about receiving a call. That's how you kind of got involved in this case, right? You got yes. A so you got a call from Hobbs, Hobbs Police Department. Okay. And, and it, essentially, did they come <coughs> down to where you were at and, and, and no, they, no, speak I, to you in person? Or? No, they I believe they called the store, and after hours, the store, the, any calls after hours goes to my cell phone. Okay. So, and that's how they contacted me. Okay, so you got you got like a forwarded call on your cell phones. Yes. Oh, what, about what time was that again? Some the 7.35, 7.40, I don't know the exact time, but it is after we closed. Okay, so, so you closed and you get a call, and this is on January 7th, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they asked you to to about the cameras. Is that yeah? Right? They they asked me. They asked me if the cameras were one were real and asked if they they were recording. I said yes, they were. They asked me, well, we need you to come down to the store because we need to look at the the videos. Okay, that's where I, I got a little turned around on direct exam, but um, that's fine. So so you went to the store and met them there. Is that what you yes? Did? Okay. And then did you watch? Um, this with them? Yes. Okay. Did they, um, <coughs> no, I understood, the way I understood you were looking through about eight hours worth of video. Um, yeah, we looked through several hours of video. Yeah, we did. You, you and the police? Yes. Okay. And then did you, and then as I understand it, you, you had, you somehow put it onto a thumb drive. A thumb drive. Were they there present for this whole thing or not? Yes, I gave it to the detectives. Okay. Um, all right, let me see. Here. 
Okay, so you hand him the thumb drive. Um, that's evidence in this case, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then you were told not to do anything with that. You, you didn't, they didn't tell me anything about that. They just, I gave them the video and they didn't say anything else. So you gave them a copy of it. They didn't say, they didn't say to you, hey, this is evidence in case. Please don't release it to the press or put it on Facebook. They didn't say anything about that. But you did go ahead and put it on Facebook. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, what, all eight hours? No. Just, just what we're seeing here in court. Well, I don't think I just did what was pertinent, what I, you know, what I saw. What well, you deemed pertinent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they never told you, um, hey, don't, don't put anything on, on social media or don't um, disseminate this information. Um, they maybe late, later afterwards, I don't remember when, they just said, hey, just, you know, going forward, don't do anything else. Oh, I'm assuming they, they caught attention to the fact that you've gone and done that. I'm assuming, yes. So after the fact, they, they alerted, they said to you, hey, no more of that stuff. Well, they just asked me not to. Yeah. So what would you, what'd you put it on? What'd you put it on Facebook? Yes. What else? It was just Facebook. There wasn't another website you uploaded stuff to? No, I, a, lot of, a lot of news agencies got a hold of it and asked my permission to use it. I said yes. But, you, but I mean, you, you had to have been aware. I mean, you were watching the video with him, right? Yeah. So you had to have been aware it was a serious police matter. Yeah, it was hard to watch. Yes, I did. Yeah, I'm not asking if it was hard to watch. I mean, I saw it too. But yeah. what I'm what I'm saying is, you knew sitting there with the police, you knew darn well it was a criminal investigation, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was an ongoing investigation at that point. Just beginning, like I said, I don't know. No. So you thought it was a good idea just put it out there, put it out there on Facebook. Yep. If I may have a moment, Judge. Yeah, you may. Uh, I don't have any further questions at this time, Judge. Thank you. Any redirect? Mr. Ambrioli, um, you said it was hard to watch. Uh, did uh, did finding that video affect you? Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna object to relevance. I don't I don't know why that's relevant. Uh, I'm I'm gonna allow it. To, you kind of open up the door by asking about why you put it on Facebook. Overruled. And so, Mr. Ambrioli, um, uh, then. You, you took parts, little segments of the video, and you, you put it on Facebook. Yes. Um, and so, uh, why, why, did you, uh, why did you feel necessary to put it on Facebook? Just to make people aware of things like this go on, you know, that we all need to work together to you know, watch out for stuff like this. No, it was hard was watching five hours of video of people throwing trash on the baby all day. That was hard to watch. That was real hard to watch. And, you know, just putting myself in the baby's shoes, you know, people throwing trash all day. Yeah. Yeah. Sustain. And, and so, um, it was, you, you yourself, you didn't just start the video and then go do something else in your store and leave the police sitting at the monitor. You watched it yourself. Yes. I don't need anything further. Any follow up? No, sir. Any questions from the jury of Mr. Embryo? Don't see any. Any objection to excusing Mr. Embryo? No objection, no. No, sir. You're excused, sir. Thank you. I'll call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. The uh, state calls Michael Green.
jury wants to stand and stretch your legs, you can while we're waiting for the witness. The uh, court monitor has requested if you make an objection, uh, please speak into the mic because we're making a record. Yeah, Judge, I, or yes, Judge, I, I think I try to turn it off. And the other thing I would tell you is be careful about speaking if the, if the mic's not on mute because they're very sensitive and it, anybody can hear it. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. All right. attention to a particular date, January 7th of 2022. Uh, does that date stand out to you for any reason at all? I'm not sure about dates, but I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, what do you think I'm talking about? About the baby. And when you're referring to a baby... I found it in the Okay. Uh, Your Honor, uh, permission to publish what's been entered into evidence as Exhibit 4 uh, just at certain times, though. You may. Okay. It's in evidence. Now, do you recognize what is uh, depicted uh, in the time signature for purposes of our record is the 18 second mark uh, on the screen? Say again? Uh, do you recognize what's depicted on this screen? The truck? Uh, yeah, what do you, whose truck is that? Hector's. Uh, were you inside the truck uh, on the date that's indicated here? Yes, sir. Uh, what about this? Uh, these green looking box objects? Do you know what those are? Trash cans. Uh, and did you observe trash cans uh, on this evening? Yes, sir. And I'm going to push forward to uh, to a time signature. And before I do so, uh, who else was inside of Hector's truck? April. Me and Hector. And then in terms of the time, do you see the time signature at the bottom, 736? Yes, sir. Do you have any reason to dispute uh, that that was approximately the time uh, that you sure. arrived there with April and Hector? About right seems like it looks like about the time we left the casino about somewhere around that time. And let's talk a little bit about your trip to the casino. So uh, what had you been doing uh, that day with Hector in April? Uh, it was just panhandling. And what, if anything, led you to this particular dumpster that night? I asked him for a ride to the casino and went from there and needed a ride back. And then in terms of the uh, ride back, did you end up getting outside of the, uh, the truck at any point? Mm, just right there with this picture. And I'm going to jump forward on it, uh, Exhibit 4 to the uh, three minute, five second mark. Uh, could you point out for us uh, where April is on this freeze frame? He's in the passenger seat. And then what about this uh, gentleman that is outside near those dumpsters but to the left? I don't know who that is. Uh, what about the gentleman that is to the right? By the trash can? Mm -hmm. uh, that is Hector. Uh, would it be fair to say that the person to your left is, is you? Uh, yes, by the trash can. Okay. Uh, and then what were you doing by the trash can uh, around this time? I'm just looking for, I believe he's looking for scrap metal. What, do you recall what you were wearing that night? Mm, pants and whatever it's. I'm not quite sure. It's jacket. I don't remember. And 
then let's play a little bit through this uh, video. Uh, can you tell whether you're wearing a long sleeve or a short sleeve? Long sleeve. Uh, were you wearing a jacket that night? I believe so. Uh, why would you be wearing a jacket that night? Because it's cold. And in terms of this general time of year, uh, January, what season is that? January, up to right now. Uh, in January, what season is that? It's winter. Uh, in terms of the general temperatures around this period of time, was it also cold? Yeah, it was cold. That's why, yeah. Now I'm going to jump forward to the uh, 3 minute and 50 uh, second mark, approximately. Uh, is April inside of the vehicle still, or is she outside of the vehicle? I believe she's outside right there. It looks like, yeah, there she is, with the light in her hand. By the second dumpster, the middle dumpster. At this point in time, were you looking for anything? Yes, I was on the side of the trash can. I stood up on top of the, the side ledge, edge, whatever, and started pulling stuff out. And why was it that you started pulling stuff out, out or around? This I don't know. Because he said it was a baby, and I just, some reason just, you know, just miracles happened, and I just took stuff out. And when you're mentioning that miracles happen, why do you use that phrase? Cause I, I don't know, because it's because I planned on jump. I was going to just jump in, but for some reason, you know, it's just instead it got, you know, I went on the side and did that. Do you, Other way. do you have any concerns about what could have happened had you chosen to jump in? Yeah, that would have been bad, yeah. Uh, with regards to uh, the sounds of a baby, did you hear sounds of a baby? When I first walked up. So when I'm playing from approximately this time mark, the three minute, 50 second period, is this the period of time where you're actually looking for the source? Yeah, the I believe I'm on the side of the left side of the trash can. You can't really tell, but I climbed up on the side where they pick it up. That's where I start pulling stuff out, the boxes and stuff, if I'm right. And when you're pulling stuff out, what was the purpose behind pulling uh, uh, the other garbage out, the garbage out of the, the dumpster? I don't know, because it kept making noise, like every, I, whatever it was, it make noise about every 30 seconds, 15, 20 seconds, it make weird noise. So we just, just what kept me from, I guess, I don't know. Were you trying to find the baby? Yeah, we were trying to locate whatever we were hearing. And we'll let the video play uh, to the 5 minute, 10 second mark. Now, I see that something has been pulled out of the dumpster. Uh, did, was the sound coming from that bag? Yes, sir. What are we seeing at this point in time uh, that April, you, and Hector are doing with regards to that bag? Uh, April's opening, I believe, right there. Do you see, and I stopped the video at the five minute, uh, 54 second mark. Uh, do you see that something is in April's arms? Yes. What is that? I believe it's a baby. What was your reaction when you saw a baby come out of that bag? I didn't actually see it come out. I just, no. I don't remember if I'd seen it, actually see it come out, but I heard him talk it, say, when they opened the bag, he goes, oh fuck, it's a baby. And I, that chills, you know, I didn't, that's why I set the back down, the whole reason, because it was like dead weight, and I don't know, just had bad feeling. Uh, did it surprise you that there was a baby in the dumpster? A little bit. Have you ever seen a baby in a dumpster no. before? No. Were you concerned for the baby? Yeah, that's what, what I was thinking when I was on the 911 call. Why were you concerned? Because well, it could be saved. And we're going to play through to the 6 minute 10 second mark. Do you see that there's uh, some sort of light 
uh, that is up near your ear. I see head. that. Uh, what is that? I guess it's a phone. What were you doing at or around this period of time? Uh, down now, talking to the cops. Okay. And, Your Honor, we're going to lay some foundation for States 33. Permission to approach the witness. You may. Uh, do you recognize what I'm showing to you? Yes. Uh, what do you recognize it to be? Uh, 30, uh, what are they called? Uh, would it be fair to call it a flash drive? Flash drive, there you go. And you've heard the contents of this flash yes, drive? Yes, sir. Uh, are the contents of this flash drive a, a fair and accurate representation of the 911 call that you Yes. Uh, Your Honor, at this time the state moves for the admission of 33. Any objection? Your Honor, we'll ask for further foundation to relate for the state to play the, um, the beginning of it so that the witness can properly identify it. All right, you may. I'll conditionally receive it subject to him identifying the start of it. Yes, Your Honor. That that's your 911 call? Yes, sir. And no further objection. Okay. Uh, States Exhibit 33 is received into evidence and may be published in its entirety. Yes, sir. Uh, what is uh, Stanley Street? Uh, Just 
pausing it at the three minute, four second mark to ask a question. Uh, I hear there's a change of voice. Who's the voice that we're hearing? Answer. Hey, I'm going to you. Object to the 911 call, it's in evidence. You did not object in any fashion or request that the evidence objection to the rule. The exhibits at the four minute, 41 second mark, may I continue publication? You may. Returning to the, uh, this surveillance video, for my next question, I'm going to uh, pull it to the eight minute mark to ask you some questions. Mr. Green, do you observe that the truck is in a different location? Yes. Uh, was the truck on or was it off? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Uh, and who, if anyone, was inside of the truck at this point? I believe that's your neighbor. Uh, what about the baby? And the baby. And do you see a vehicle pulling up? Yes. What vehicle was that? Mm, I'm not sure. Just a random vehicle. And pulling forward to the 11 minute mark. What vehicles are arriving on the scene at approximately this time signature? Uh, police officers. Uh, at or around this time or within the moments immediately following it, uh, did law enforcement take, take that baby? Yeah, I didn't even see them take it to bed. Okay. Why was it that you called 911 when you saw that baby? 
Uh, Hector didn't phone. That's what I want to call. Why did you speak with the 911 dispatcher? Because he gave me a, the phone to call, and I said, sure. Well, you know, it's just instinct. Did you have any concerns? What do you mean? Uh, were, you, were you motivated by any concern in terms of... Well, yeah, I felt like it's honored. You know, just privilege, you know. And who, if anyone, were you worried about? Maybe. Your Honor, at this time, the state passes the witness. Cross-exam. Ms. Otto Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Green. Hi. So we've seen the video and um, seen how the baby was taken out of the dumpster. You remember the events of this night, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, just a quick few questions for you. You weren't the person who picked the baby out of the dumpster, were you? Yes, I pulled the bag. So you pulled the bag out? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And then you set it down on the floor? Yes, ma'am. Were you the one who opened the bag? No, ma'am. You did not open it? No. Okay. So when you brought the bag out of the dumpster, who actually opened it? Mm, I guess April did. I don't know. I, I, I can't really remember exactly who opened it. I just know I sat it down and kind of turned. I believe I walked away. I don't know, but watching the video, I don't, I can't exactly recall. You remember you were a little freaked out when you... Well, yeah, I just had a bad feeling, like I said, and I just didn't want to open it. Okay, so I kind of set it down gently. You set it down and you, you were. Yeah, I was just, yeah, and one of them. Opened it. Yeah. Okay, so you don't know if it was tied really tight. No, I don't. Time. So you don't know if it was tight with a broken. No, it was just wrapped, wrapped like, I believe it was just kind of twisted. It was just twisted? I believe so. Okay. And then April opened it. I give he. I'm not sure. But it, it certainly wasn't you. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, no further questions. Any redirect? Uh, very limited, Your Honor. Uh, just to just a couple of uh, follow-up questions, Mr. Green. Uh, you were able to provide information about who actually uh, opened the bag. Uh, at the time that you held the bag, uh, what did it feel like? I just dead weight. Relevance. I mean, I'm sorry, outside of the book process. Sustain. Uh, with regards to uh, explaining uh, what you were doing at the time that the, the bag was pulled out, uh, why weren't you the one that ended up opening up that bag? I just had a feeling, like a weird feeling. You know how you get chills sometimes? I just had, I just didn't want, I figured it would be like a cat, dead cat or something, I don't know, just bad feeling. Not to sit down. Uh, and is that why you were not the one that ended up opening the bag? Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, no further questions, thank you. Any follow-up, Ms. Otopoji? Nothing, Your Honor. Any questions from the jury of Mr. Green? Any objection to excusing Mr. Green? Stick. Yes, Your Honor. Not from defense. You're excused, sir. Thank you. How's the jury doing? Does anybody need a break, or are we good to call the next witness? If you need a break, let me know. Okay, call your next witness. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Hasso. Uh, could you tell the jury your full name? 
Uh, Ekman, Jesus Castro. And what city and state do you live in? In Hobbs. And how long have you lived in Hobbs? Mm, all my life. And do you know a person by the name of April Nuttall? Uh, yes. How do you know April? Uh, I met her in the, in the streets. And uh, was April your friend? Mm, I never met her before, but I uh, tried to help her. Okay. Care of home. Okay. Uh, did you know a person by the name of Michael Green? Yeah, Michael Green. Yeah, I married, married too. And uh, how long have you known Michael Green? Uh, not too long. Not too long. No, like uh, the years. Let me take you back um, to uh, the the night that you all uh, were at the dumpsters and and you found something. Okay. Do you remember that night? Yes, ma'am. Who was with you that, that night? Uh, me and April and, and, and Michael Green. And uh, were you in any uh, type of vehicle? I was in uh, my truck, a GT, Hellcat. And uh, what had, where had you all been that evening? Uh, I was at the casino. And then she called me, she said she needed a ride. And Mike, he was, he was with me, and then it's when uh, I drove by there. And... So you and Michael were at the casino? Yes, ma'am. And you got a call from, you said she. Who is this a she? April. April. And so did you go get April somewhere to give her a ride? Yes, from uh, Albertson store. From the Albertson? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and then where were the three of you going gonna to go? I was gonna, I was gonna get Michael right to his house. Uh, I don't know where he, he is, but I was gonna get him close. What, what he told me to, he was gonna get. And um, did you all decide to stop somewhere before you were were, were dropping off Michael? I suggested to, I was on in the container, and uh, that's what we did. And so you stopped by the, the trash containers? Yes, and I saw, I, I heard something uh, like crying. And uh, the second time I met, I just wanted to call Michael. And he helped me move boxes and then found the bag. Now, when you found the bag, um, did somebody get it out of the, the trash the Mike, trash dumpster? Michael did. They put it on the ground and uh, April opened it. And do you remember how she opened it, like how it was closed? Uh, I don't remember exactly how, how it was, but it was, uh, it was not even nearly closed. When she opened it, it was not even, I mean, too tight. And then uh, she grabbed it. Okay, so it was it was closed, but it wasn't like it wasn't like tied up in a tight knot or mm -hmm. anything. I don't remember that, but, but it was. I mean, it was because uh, when uh, Michael got it, he just wanted to open it. And then in April, I called. Uh, I told her that something was moving, and then she opened it the rest. And when she opened it, I were you able to see what was inside? Yeah, I did. And what did you see? A little baby. Now, uh, when you saw that little baby in there, did you say anything or do anything? Well, I freaked out and then I uh, uh, gave Michael my, my phone. I couldn't, I couldn't get it going, so I gave it to him and they just wanted to call me. And I want one. Now, would, would you say that um, Finding that baby was kind of unexpected. Yes, yeah, that was it. Is. Um, and and um, you said you couldn't get your phone going. Did was it? Uh, I, I don't know what phone saying this, so it's why I gave it to him. And then, what did you see uh, April do? Uh, she she 
she got a baby, she, she took the truck and I took my jacket and I, I wrapped that baby up. And then what uh, does she do from there? Where does she go? She had on the truck, inside the truck, with the heater on. And uh, are you there with uh, Michael while he's got your phone? Uh, what was it again? Uh, did you stay there by Michael while he's got your phone? Yeah, he was on the phone. Uh, the, the baby, we already had the baby in the, in the truck. And uh, did Michael call 911? Yes, ma'am. Uh, at some point, did you talk to the person on the 911 call? Uh, when I was inside the truck, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't say words, but I gave it to April. That she, she did the rest. Um, was it kind of a, a emotionally upsetting to you what all you were finding at that time? Just until today. And still today. Now, um, were you, once the baby was out of the bag and you said wrapped up uh, and inside your truck, uh, could you hear the baby making any sounds at that time? No, he was uh, he was moving. He, he was, she warmed me up. And, uh, and then the, the people came, the ambulance. And this uh, female officer came and took the baby. An officer came and took the baby? A female. And uh, had you been to those dumpsters before? Once or twice. But see, it's. Uh, when I go to the store, I go to there every day. God put me there for the baby. I mean, that's only, that's only thing I did. And when you stopped on that night at the dumpsters and uh, you got out to look in them, I mean, what were you what were you hoping you might find that night? Uh, uh, sometimes I put some boards, the material, the people throw away that I can use. And I use cardboard to go out of some trucks that are open. What was the, the weather or the temperature like that night? It was like 30 degrees. Or that. Were you wearing a, a jacket or a coat of any kind? Yeah, I, I was. And to, uh, the way in the biggest thing I think the trucks I had to give the baby my jacket. You had to get the baby your jacket? Yes. Uh, your Honor, if I could, we will uh, put a State's Exhibit 4 out for a little portion uh, with this witness. Uh, Mr. Hasso, uh, I have State's Exhibit 4 up now. Can you see it on that monitor in front of you? Yes, sir. Uh, do you recognize a vehicle in that video? Yes, my truck. Uh, do you recognize uh, anybody that you can see outside of the truck? Uh, say it's, uh, it's April. You can see April. Do you see anybody else? Outside the truck on the standing up. I was going to go down that bed. Okay, you were going to, you were getting out. Yes. Okay, let me let it play. 
It's at uh, 36 seconds for the record of Exhibit 4. Now we see uh, two individuals walking. That's Michael. Uh, that's Michael and Neil. Okay, so Michael, you can see Michael, and then we can see yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, and are you the one at the dumpster? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and you said you were looking for some material that you could use. Yes. Uh, could you hear any sounds when you first got to that dumpster? When I started moving the, the boxes. When you started moving them? Yes. Okay, all right. I'm going to uh, move forward to three minutes and five seconds. Okay, I'm going to let it play first uh, a little bit. Uh, Mr. Hasso, starting at three minutes and three seconds. We, we see that Michael is, seems kind of like he's standing on this edge of something. There's an on the side that the, the, the press can and, on the outside. And why, why are things being moved from the first dumpster to the middle one? Because we, we heard that somebody, I thought it was a new baby kid or a dog, whatever it was. And uh, we dug, we put the boxes over there. And so and you. And Lori brought the bag out. You need to speak into okay. the mic or no one can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. So um, you were telling me that uh, you could hear something, and so you're moving the boxes. Yes. Now, we see now, is April out of the truck now? Uh, well, I wasn't was looking at but no, let me see. No, she's still there. Let's right. See, so. And we oh. see some kind of light. Oh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's April right there. You went to your truck. What did you go get? Is something long? No, I don't know. You don't remember? No. Yeah, but when when she got there, she uh she she heard that too, so and then we started. Okay, Most now of, I'm gonna pause it. See? We see that there the bag there's a bag yes, on the ground. That's the bag. That's the bag. Uh and we see Michael sets it on the ground. Yes. Uh, and so uh, you told us that he, not you, but Michael's the one that starts to open it. Yeah. Could you hear sounds once that bag was on the ground? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, it was moving. It was moving. Yes. And after, but it was, it was crying and inside the container. And then it's, when he set it down, I don't know what it was, baby. I'm going to play forward to round five, ten. Kind of looks like y'all are having some kind of discussion. So I, I didn't know what it was. I mean, when she opened it like this, when I, we saw the baby. Man. Okay.
Now, did you already give uh, Michael your phone? Yes. I'm going to pause it at uh, 601. Um, now, um, you get Michael the phone. Uh, we see April right now. Um, uh, do you say anything to April at that time? No, I was kind of confused there. Uh, then uh, she went inside the truck. And then we all moved the truck from there. Yeah. Why did you move the truck? Uh, I don't know. I just moved out of the way. You just moved it away from where the dumpsters were? Yes. Now, um, when the, the, the police got there, were you inside your truck or were you uh, standing outside uh, kind of watching, waiting for them? I think I was inside. But it was outside of her. And then he got the point in. And move forward. At seven uh, fifty-five. So, uh, let it play just a few seconds. Um, do you see you now moving the truck to that location? Yes. It looks like your your lights are on. Was the truck running? Yes. Um, did you have the heat running? Yes. Um. Did you have, you mentioned your coat, did you have anything else inside your truck to, to wrap the baby up with? Any other blankets or anything else? Uh, I think I did. I think I gave my jacket or something else in the case was there. I mean, I don't remember what it was, but it just, we had rats in there. Because we all feel we were sitting in the front because we had some stuff in the back. The back seat. I can have just a moment here. Yeah, but. Uh, I will pass the witness. Cross exam. Yes, May I proceed? You bet. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Could you pronounce your last name for me again? Uh, my last name? Your uh, last name, yes. Uh, Hasso. It's a J-A. It's a so. Okay, Hasso. Mr. Hasso, um, I want to go back to some of your earlier testimony. You testified that you knew April, and where did you say you knew her from? Uh, from the street. Okay, and what do you mean by that? She was here on, uh, down the street uh, by... Uh, it was by rail tracks somewhere in there. Okay. And uh, she was homeless, and then uh, I gave her home to live. Okay, so uh, you knew her from a specific neighborhood, and you knew her to be homeless? Mm, I'm not, not that long, man. It's better, better than uh, I took her home. Okay, and you said at some point uh, you moved her into your home? Uh, yes, but uh, she had a, a man, uh, Tracy, who so, uh, okay. boy, good man. Thank you. And um, when you moved her in, were y'all dating? Yep. When you moved her in, were y'all dating? No. no. Did y'all ever date? Mm, uh, since uh, her man left, but then, uh, yeah. Okay. And you also testified that at some point while you and Michael were at the casino, April called you? Yes, sir. Okay. And what did she call you to do again? From the other side. What did she call you to do? Address of store. Oh, to get her from the store, you said? Yeah, she called me to my phone in the casino, so I to go pick her up from the store. Okay, what store was that? Arbison. Okay, and um, at some point you, you testified that you went to the dumpsters 
And why were you going to the dumpsters? Uh, just to look for my favorite stuff that I, like I use, cardboard, whatever. Okay, and what, and what were you looking for? You said you uh, looked for things for work? Yeah, like, like material, uh, boards that I can use. Okay, and what do you use those types of things for? Mm, that's uh, building pants or anything, a wall. You said to build a fence or a wall? Oh, I mean, no. Whatever I need, when I live it, I will have it at the house. Okay. Or metal, drivers, shell it, house out of metal, whatever. Okay, and at some point, uh, you said y'all went to a specific dumpster. That night, we did. Okay, and um, you, you testified that you heard something. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay, and at some point, you testified that Michael got a bag out of the dumpster? Uh, yeah. We removed all the boxes out of there, yeah. We, we got it out of the bag. Okay. And um, you also testified that while the bag was on the ground, you saw it moving? Yes. Okay. Uh, and were you present when April opened the bag? Yeah, I was. Okay. And uh, once you saw what was in the bag, is that when you gave Michael your phone? Yes. Okay. And Michael, uh, was Michael the one to make the 911 call? Yes. And did you speak to dispatch at some point? Uh, I did when I was in the truck. truck. Uh, I, I couldn't cope by, couldn't talk. I was in, you know, in shock. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, I handed the phone to April. And then the ambulance came real quick. Okay, when you handed the phone to April, was she still inside the truck? Yes. Okay, um, so she still had the uh, the child at the time? The and one and was and her, and her chest. Okay, and were you present while April was talking to 911? Yes. Okay, and at some point uh, when law enforcement got there, did you give a statement? Uh, repeat that again. Oh, whenever law enforcement got to the scene, did you give a statement? Uh, the, uh, uh, somebody got there first and yeah, I talked to him and then uh, he was getting information and all stuff, the license plate. And after that, the, I think the detective came uh, after the arrest. Thank you, Mr. Also. Your Honor, I'll pass the witness. Thank you. Any redirect? No. Any questions from the jury of Mr. Hasso? Any objection to excusing Mr. Hasso? No objection. No objection. You're excused, sir. How's the jury doing? Anyone need a break? All right. Call your next witness. Say we'll call April Nuttall. Pardon me? Yes. Yes. Can you take down the so I can mute Take down the off the screen. Otherwise I can't mute up here. Take down this. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, it appears that uh, a bathroom break is needed, so we're going to take a break at this time. During the break, don't discuss the case. Don't allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. Don't do any independent research about the case. Don't form any fixed opinions about the case until the case is finally submitted to you. Please stand for the jury.
all seated. Uh, we'll be in recess until the jury's back. It'll be about 15 minutes. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, guys.
others? Yes, sir. I, I, we, we talked about it. Are you okay if I'm talking about it? <laughs> uh, we talked about it, and, and there's there's a plethora of options, at least theoretically, and, and I think what becomes complicated is the step, the, the multiple verdicts, multiple forms, instruction. Well, what I'm telling you is when the evidence is in, yeah, you want them ready. I, I want it. them, and I want to be able to look at them in advance. In advance, so I can make sure that we do our best to give proper instructions. Yes, sir. All right. Would would tentatively be Wednesday morning. Wednesday would morning would be fine. Well, shoot, is tomorrow Wednesday already? Is Tomorrow is Wednesday. Uh, if you get them Thursday morning, oh, that's fine. But I do not want you waiting to be on Thursday morning. Yeah. Obviously, if the evidence changes or something changes, you'll be given an opportunity. But I need to be looking at what you think you're going to do. Yes, sir. Yes, All right. sir. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll get on it, Judge. So tonight. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Thank you. Okay. We're out of the presence of the jury. Anything else we need to talk about while we're waiting on the jury? Hi, Your, Honor. Your Honor, I would just let the court know that for scheduling purposes for today, I know I gave the court a tentative schedule. Yes. Uh, we do have uh, April Nutt all ready to go next. We will skip down after her to Caleb Shearer. Uh, he is here, uh, but that will be the last witness we have available uh, today, if that's okay with it sounds like that would pretty much fill out our day. I think it'll be pretty close. And then we'll be starting um, tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll start, uh, we'll get the jury here at 8.15, but we all need to be here at 8. So somebody needs to be ready to testify at approximately 8.30, be my guess. Please stand for the jury. You may be seated. Ms. Blues, you may call your next witness. Uh, yes, Your Honor, we have, uh, the state is called April Nuttall. All right. You'll raise your right hand to be sworn, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of law? Yes, sir. You may be seated. <coughs> you may proceed. Please state your name for the jury. April Nuttall. Uh, Ms. Nuttall, what city and state do you live in? Hobbs, New Mexico, 88240. And how long have you lived in Hobbs? Uh, born and raised. Uh, do you know a person by the name of Hector Hosso? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. That's um, my boyfriend. And do you, how long have you known Yes, ma'am. I mean, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to talk over you. Uh, how long have you known Hector? Um, <clears throat> I met him way back when. But I've been with him for like two something years now. Do you know a person by the name of Michael Green? Yes, ma'am. How do you know Michael? Um, when I was living, I was homeless, living on a mattress. 
and we we become good friends over the years. And I met him. I met his dad, and we we're, we're good friends. Let me uh, uh, kind of move you to the day that uh, you were at the dumpsters with Hector and Michael, uh, and you found a bag that had something in it. <clears throat> yeah, we were uh, dr driving, and Michael wanted a ride to where he wanted to go. And I don't um, object, Judge. It's not responsive at this point. She responded with Alan's narrative. And, just a minute. Oh, okay. Sustain. Sorry. Answer the question that's asked. You know what? Just answer the questions you ask you. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, wait a uh, minute, wait, wait. Let's start with the question, okay? Okay, what's the question? I, I'm going to ask you the question. Okay. okay. Uh, so, Michael wanted a ride, and so uh, did you all end up stopping somewhere? Yeah, H Hector decided to go dumpster diving. And I sit in the truck, and then I got bored, and so I, um, I turned around and looked at him, and I saw Michael look in the bag, but, and then Hector said something about he heard a cat or a dog, and I said, oh, hold up, let me hear. And I said, that don't sound like no cat or dog. And I read the bag open. I said, oh, my freaking God is a baby. And he could barely even cry. He's so hoarse and he's so freezing cold. I was warming his little arms up. I went to pick his body up by his body. And I forgot about the newborns having uh, difficulties holding their head up. And I accidentally picked him up. But his head went back, so I set him back down in the trash. And trying to maneuver him and, and Hector said, don't touch him. I said, the heck if I won't. I picked him up, I grabbed his little neck and his body. He was wrapped up in a red towel and yeah, he could hardly even cry and um, I, I, we were all freaking out by then. And um, I had to yell at Hector like five times to call the police. You know, and, I went, and he told me, go to the truck. And I sat down and I started to peel that red towel off the baby. Um, and all I saw was a little bitty winky and a long umbilical cord. And at this point I am gonna object to narrative judgment. All right, sustain. Uh, all right. Let's break it down a little bit with questions from Okay. Gotcha. So I, I try to just keep your answers short for a little bit, and then I'll ask another question. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. No, you're you're fine. Um, so, I when you start to pull the the towel off of the baby, are you outside? Are well, you? I was sitting truck? in the truck. In the truck. And he, and I was m maneuvering him to get him warm in my jacket my snap-on jacket, and then I went to take off the towel, and it felt like it was peeling off his skin. So I just caught a glimpse of his little bitty winky and a long umbilical cord. Now, once you were had him wrapped up inside your jacket, uh, did the baby make any sounds? Yeah, he, he started to cry again, and and I was babying him, rubbing his little, little freezing arms, and, um, you know, just babying him, you know, because we were waiting on the ambulance guys. And uh, this was kind of an unexpected uh, event for that evening. For yes, ma'am. Uh, now, you said that, that uh, you're the one that, that tore the bag open. Uh, do you remember how it was closed or what you had to do to open it? All I had to do was open the bag and he was laying on a whole bunch of trash in a red towel. And uh, you, uh, 
Did you stay in the truck once you got in the truck with the baby? Got him in the truck? Yeah, I stayed there until the ambulance guys got there after yelling at Hector to call the ambulance guys. And uh, while you're in the truck with the baby, mm -hmm. uh, what could you tell anything? You said you could hear sounds. Could you tell anything else about uh, how the baby was doing? Could you hear anything about how the baby's breathing was? He could barely even cry. I'm he could barely even I'm cry. What's the objection? It, it's, it calls for speculation and lacks foundation. I'll sustain it. Uh, you may ask a more specific question. Could you hear the baby's breathing when you were holding the baby? Yeah, uh, he was crying. Yeah, he was breathing. And he was breathing. But I noticed he needed medical attention. Why do you say that? Because he was freezing cold and he had a long umbilical cord and blood all over his forehead. And yeah, he needed medical attention. At some point, did somebody hand you the telephone to talk to uh, the 911? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Michael Green, uh, I heard the, the recording, uh, uh, the, the ambulance guys wanted to know how the baby was doing, so I told them exactly what I thought. Do you remember what you told them? Uh, yes, um, that... It was like he was so sick and tired of crying. Like he was hoarse and freezing cold. What? And yeah, that, that just that traumatized me. Now, when the uh, somebody got there to help you and and uh, Hector and Michael with the baby. Yeah. Uh, who got there first? Was it the police? Ambulance guys. Ambulance got there. Yeah, this lady came up to it and I didn't want to hand them over, but I had to. <laughs> yeah, and I handed it to him, I handed him to him, to her. I'm just nervous. Um, and they left. And the detective guy came up and 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 it was taking pictures of the trash sack that that baby was laying in. And uh, yeah, but the 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 ambulance guys already took the baby to the emergency room. Yep. Mr. Conlon. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. if, if I could have just a, a, a second. You may. Questions of Miss Nuttall from the jury. Any objection to excusing Miss Nuttall? No objection. No, sir. 
All right, you're excused, ma'am. Thank you. Call your next witness. I'm sorry. Your Honor, the state is calling Caleb Shearer next. I don't know if the record comes up. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. Once again, if you want to stretch your legs while we're waiting, feel free to do so. Fire Department. How long have you been uh, working for the City of Hobbs Fire Department? Uh, just over four years. And what do you do for them? Uh, EMS specialist. And just so it's clear, what does an EMS specialist do? EMS specialist. Uh, we're just responsible for uh, all the ambulance calls. We write on the ambulance. We don't fight fire. Okay. And what does EMS stand for? Emergency Medical Services. Do you have to obtain any kind of training to become an EMS specialist? Yes, ma'am. What does that training entail? Um, we are required to have at least have a New Mexico EMT intermediate license uh, in order to be employed. Do you have any educational background specializing in this area of practice? Uh, yes, ma'am. I have obtained my uh, paramedic license. Okay. When did you uh, receive that? I received that in the... in September of 21. Okay. And is that something you have to maintain or renew? Yes, ma'am. Um, was that license valid in January of 2022? Yes, ma'am, it was. Okay. Um, any other training or specialization that you have for your practice as an EMS specialist? Uh, Did we cover it? <laughs> I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, were you working for the Hobbs Fire Department in January of 2022? Yes, ma'am. As an EMS specialist? Correct. And were you on call on that day? Uh, I was on duty, yes, ma'am. On duty, okay. What was your shift or your hours for being on duty that day? We worked uh, 48 hours on and 96 hours off. Okay, so that's 48 hours straight? Correct. Um, were you dispatched to a location in the city of Hobbs on that evening? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, where specifically, if you remember, were you dispatched? Um, <clears throat> I don't remember the exact numerics. I just know that it was a Turner address. Okay. Or Thorpe, I'm sorry. And again, that was the evening of January 7th? Correct. In Hobbs, New Mexico? Yes. Uh, what was the purpose of the dispatch? Well, we were dispatched for an unresponsive uh, patient. And um, how did that dispatch come to be known to you specifically? Through the um, our learning system. I don't understand your question, I guess. Sure. I guess my question is, is that through like a 911 call center that you get dispatched? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. The 911 calls go through LCCA, and then they come to us. Okay. And the purpose of that call was an unresponsive patient. Correct. Were you dispatched with any other individuals? With any other? Yes. yes uh, we had two other uh, providers on the ambulance with me. 
So what were their roles? On that particular call, um, one of them was the uh, driver to, to and from scene, and then the other one was uh, one of our providers once we got on scene. And what specifically was your role um, as part of the dispatch? Um, I was riding in the front seat, and we're responsible uh, as a passenger in the front seat to uh, just kind of re uh, read through the CAD, figure out what's going on as far as what kind of scene we're going to, and additional resources that we might need, and then just kind of organizing and make sure everybody kind of knows their roles of what's going to go on. Okay. And for those that don't know, what is a CAD? A computer-aided computer dispatch. It's just um, all the information that the 911 caller uh, the 911 dispatcher is receiving from the caller is put in that input and we can actually read it. Okay. Do you recall what you were reading um, on your way to the scene? Not many specifics. A uh, few little details, but not the whole incident itself. Okay. Of the details you recall, what were they? Um, I remember reading that it was, uh, they were found an infant in a dumpster and that they had put the... Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. He's testifying as to what he remembered. You may continue, Mr. Sheriff. Um, the, in the dumpster, and then that they had removed, um, put them in a jacket in a uh, pickup or a truck. Okay. And you arrived by a uh, vehicle, or what type of vehicle did you by arrive? By one of our ambulances. So when you arrived on scene, do you remember roughly what time it was? No, no. Okay. Was it morning, evening? It was uh, evening. Was it dark out? Correct. Yes. Well, what's the first thing you did when you arrived on scene? When we arrived on scene, um, I got out of the ambulance and I was met by a uh, HPD officer. Um, and she was actually carrying the infant. I opened the door to the side of the ambulance for her. She was able to step in with the patient, or with the infant, and that's where we started our care. Okay. What do you recall immediately observing about the infant? Um, once I received the infant from the officer, uh, I noticed that the infant was uh, cyanotic, or a little blue in the face and on the extremities, um, and then the, he was still covered in blood. So based on that initial reaction, what sort of care did you administer? Immediately, um, on the visual examination, that's what I was noticed, and that's uh, the cyanotic is a sign of low oxygen. So that was going to be one of our first things that we addressed, and then um, started manipulating or started moving with the patient. That's when we felt that um, he was cold okay. and started to actively warm him. How could you tell that he was low in oxygen? Uh, by the cyanotic color of his skin, or the bluish color of his skin. Okay. And to address that, um, what did you do? Uh, administered uh, blow by oxygen. Did you observe any uh, physical injuries? No physical injuries. Okay. Did you observe anything else? Um, on the infant's body besides blood? Uh, the blood, the umbilical cord, and that was about all I noticed. Uh, did you administer any care for purposes of addressing the umbilical cord? I did. Um, I clamped the umbilical cord um, with just a clamp that we carried on the ambulance in our OB kits um, just to prevent any kind of uh, blood loss or fluid loss from the umbilical cord itself. Did you transport this infant anywhere? Yes, we transported uh, him to the uh, hospital here, or there in Hobbs. Do you know which hospital? Covenant Health Hobbs. <clears throat> and why did you feel the need to do that? Um, patient's conditions itself, just everything that was noted beforehand, and there was no um, guardian on scene to like we had to act on what was best for the patient. Uh, did 
did you um, create a report following that evening? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, did you know any vitals or did you assess any vitals of the patient in, during the transport? Uh, no, ma'am. We never like got a true um, measure on the vitals. It was more the visual assessment. Uh, we didn't have the um, like the pulse ox that you would see on a, in a hospital that like wraps to the skin, like the adhesive type. We just had the clamp that would go over our finger, and with the uh, infant size, it just wouldn't fit. Okay. Um, did you assess any uh, pain to the patient? Uh, we. Just like stimulating the patient, like trying to get a reaction? Yes. Okay, yeah, we, we did that, and um, initially on scene, we didn't get much of a reaction. Is, based on your experience, is that common for infants or babies to be non-responsive? Uh, it can be in the initial minute or two after birth, um, just because they're kind of getting used to them, their own body, kind of getting on their own. Um, but generally, without within the first thirty seconds to a minute, they're responsive to um, all that stuff. Okay, and did that ever occur with this particular patient? As we got closer to the hospital, yes. Okay. Um, did you observe any uh, change in the child or infant's temperature on your way to the hospital? It did appear to feel uh, slightly warmer uh, the further we got or the closer we got to the hospital. And any change in the colorization, bluish color you already indicated? Yes, uh, he did start to uh, pink up or start presenting signs of a more normal skin color. Okay. <clears throat> did you collect any evidence in this case? No. How long would you say you were with the patient or the patient was in your care? Estimate of about five to eight minutes. Okay. And once you arrived at Covenant Hospital, uh, who took over care of the patient at that point, if the, anyone? The hospital staff, uh, several nurses and doctors that were in the room. I don't know who was the lead provider. Okay. And was your role complete at that point in time? Just briefly, also, Mr. Shearer, is there a scale used for terms of uh, administering your assessment? Yes, ma'am. And what is that scale? Uh, we have uh, two different ones. Uh, one for the pediatric size, though, we would have APGAR. So it would be like a, the appearance, the presentation, the grimace, and the reactiveness. And it just is uh, a scale that we use to judge a uh, how responsive the newborn is or a new kid. Okay. Do you use a scale known as GCS? Yes, ma'am. What is that scale? The Glasgow Cone Scale. It's just a standardized um, way of assessing um, a, a patient that we come across, and it just assigns a numerical value to their reactions. Okay. And when you say reactions, what do you mean by that? So we have different, uh, there's different portions of it. You assess their uh, responsiveness level, um, if they respond to pain, and if so, how do they do it? they respond to, uh, if, or if they respond vocally, and if so, how is it? Just different little different variables in there. Okay, so you take these variables together and come to an uh, answer on this assessment scale. Is that a fair representation? I would say that's fair, yes. Okay, um, and where was this particular infant? Uh, I do not remember the numer uh, numerical <laughs> value. Okay. Is there anything that would help refresh your memory? Uh, my report would have it in it. Okay. Um, may I approach Turner for purposes of refreshment? You may uh, approach and let the witness look at the report to see if his memory is refreshed.
record, Mr. Chair, I handed you a copy of what I believe is your report from January 7th. If you could um, please look at it silently and then let me know if your memory has been refreshed. Okay. Mr. Shearer, has your memory been refreshed? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and um, where was the baby on that GCS scale? I had a GCS of four. Okay. And I guess what is the low end and the high end of the scale? The scale is from a three to a 15. So a four is on the low end of that scale? Correct. And what does that indicate to you? Just uh, severe distress. You said a four is severe distress. What is a three mean? A three is a no motor response, no verbal, no movement. Um, basically, there's no then nothing happening to any of our stimulation or actions. And what would a uh, fifteen? Fifteen would be um, optimal, is the best for any patient that we come across. And when you say optimal, what would uh, be signs of an optimal GCS? Um, moving on their own, uh, opening their eyes spontaneously or on their own as well. And then uh, for an adult, it's like talking and everything for an infant. It'd be they're consolable if they're crying. They're consolable would be the verbal side of that. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Ms. Curley. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, Mr. Scherer, I only have a few questions for you. Uh, I want to go back through some of your testimony. You indicated, or I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you indicated that you didn't observe any physical injuries to the child. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And you also stated you only had the baby for about five to eight minutes. Is that right? Yes. And over the course of that time period, you stated that like uh, he improved a lot. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you saw like good color on his skin before you passed him off to the hospital staff? Correct. Okay. You were also describing the GCS scale. Could you tell me what that stands for uh, one more time? The Glasgow Coma Scale. Can you say it a little bit slower? The Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay, perfect. And uh, you testified that the Glasgow Co Coma Scale was, uh, is how you assess is that correct? It's one of our tools for assessment. Okay. And you only had the child for about five to eight minutes. This was your initial assessment. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, did, were you able to speak to any of the witnesses? No. Okay. So you were handed the baby from uh, an officer? Correct. And do you recall what the officer's name was? Uh, officer Maxwell. Okay. You also indicated that there was... Um, that the child was covered when the child was handed to you? Is that right? Yes. Okay. And you testified that riding with you that day was the driver and another provider. Correct. Okay. And uh, you stated that you were in the front passenger seat of the EMS. Yes. Okay. And the other person was in the back and were they helping you provide care? Correct. Okay. And when you went to the hospital and you were riding uh, in the back, you stayed in the back the entire time? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, if I may have a moment. You may. Your Honor, no further questions. All right. Any re 
direct? Just for clarity, Mr. Scher, when you arrived at the hospital, was the baby still covered in blood? Yes. And was the umbilical cord still attached? Yes. And clamped? Correct. And would you have classified the baby as still in distress? Due to the temperature, yes. Okay. The body temperature. And the reason you provided him over to the emergency is because you believed he still needed additional care? Correct. I have a moment here. You have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. This witness, I believe, may be excused. Any follow up? Your Honor, I have a moment. Yes. Your Honor, I just have a moment. Mr. Shearer, um, earlier in your testimony, didn't you indicate you also took the child to the hospital because there was no guardian? Correct. Okay, and is that the process when you don't have a guardian for a child? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, no further questions. Anything further? Yeah. Any questions from the jury? Any objection to excusing Mr. Shearer? No objection. Your excuse, sir. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to recess a little early this evening. Remember what I told you uh, from the beginning, and that is you can't discuss the case when you go home tonight. You can't talk to your loved ones, your spouse, or whoever. Uh, you can't do any independent research about the case. Stay off of social media. Don't watch the news tonight. Don't read the newspaper in the morning. You can look at all that stuff uh, if you want and talk about the case after the case is over. But until it's over, you cannot talk to anyone about the case. Uh, we're going to start tomorrow. I, I want you here at 8.15, and hopefully we'll start promptly at 8.30 when you're all in the jury room. Once you're all in the jury room and ready to go, we'll start. Um, so uh, enjoy uh, watching a ball game or Netflix or anything else other than the news or reading the newspaper tonight or in the morning. Please stand for the jury. You may be seated. Okay, anything anyone needs to discuss before we go off record this evening? Ms. Luce? No, Your Honor. Ms. Otto Poggi? Nothing on the fence. Okay, remember I told counsel you need to be here at 8 o'clock in the morning, everyone. Uh, that's, uh, we're not going to wait on somebody, hopefully. And uh, we'll see you in the morning at 8 o'clock. Court, yes, sir. No, I just, I just want to make sure on that time zone. So this is 8, 8 a.m. sharp here. 8 a.m. And if you're on time, you're late. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Court and recess. Thank you, sir.